Uh, my name is Katie Spoden. I am assistant director over at the Polsky Center. Um, welcome to today's workshop, which is about managing disputes among co-founders. And we're very excited to have Myra Castaneda here, who is a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist with Amity Chicago. And she is also the co-founder of that company. Amity Chicago counsels businesses as well as accelerators and incubators and works with clients who experience the specific ups and downs of the startup world. So we're very happy to have Myra here today. Um, during the presentation, if you wouldn't mind saving your questions until about the last 10 minutes, you can put those in the chat um, and Myra will get to those um, once we get to the end of the presentation. So with that, Myra, I will hand it over to you. Myra, it looks like you're muted. Oh, wow. So I just did the first faux pas of our <laughs> workshop. So, all right. So it's nice to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen in, in, in just a moment here so that I can just pull up the slides. But um, as I go through this, I'm just going to turn my camera off just because I've mentioned before, I, I have this really bad habit of, of staring my, at myself when I'm going through these presentations and it's very, very distracting. So I'm just going to turn it off just through the slides and then I'll turn it back on um, for questions at the end. Okay, and I am sorry to have muted, but here we are and we're just going to jump right in. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And I'm going to move this and we're going to jump right in. Okay, so right, this presentation is on and I'm not sure if I turned off my camera. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, is it off or I think we're okay. Maybe not. Still on. Still on. I'm sorry. I see it flickering. Uh -huh. All right. Now. I'm ready. I'm not great at technology, but I'm, I'm, I'm good at therapy, I promise. Okay, so <laughs> managing co-founder disputes. Um, so jumping right in. Thank you for the really fantastic intro. Um, what to expect for today, I'll just jump in and, and say a little bit more about me and Amity Chicago and what it is that we do. Um, I'll talk a bit about embracing conflict and why that's important. I'll share a few tips on fighting fair. Um, we'll talk about what to do if there's too much conflict and some next, next steps. And then at the very end, um, you know, we'll leave about 10 minutes or, or less, right? As many, as many as we need for questions. So more about me. So yes, my name is Mara Castaneda. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and one of the co-founders of Amity Chicago. Um, I received my degree and my training at Northwestern University and I have over 10 years of clinical experience. Um, I've applied my passion for relations to the entrepreneurial world and, um, you know, tech world. Um, I have done a lot of work with companies all over the world at this point. Um, we've expanded internationally, you know, a couple months ago, which has been really, really exciting. Um, but specific to Chicago, we are partnered with Techstar Chicago as their on-staff therapists for their teams. Um, I work with 1871. I've worked with Wisdom, the Food Foundry, the Garage, Northwest University, Wildfire Pre Accelerator, um, and over 40 startups and non venture backed companies. Essentially, I bring my expertise in relationship counseling to help co founders communicate properly and authentically connect. I also help manage the individual stressors and challenges that founders face day to day. So, with that, um, just a few things that sometimes, again, more information about Amity Chicago if anyone's interested, but some of the things that we work on with the clients. Um, so essentially, you know, we help build more effective communication and conflict skills. Um, we, we improve focus and performance. We work to reduce burnout and stress, which is very, very important. Um, we help to increase self-awareness and confidence. Um, we help learn how to establish and maintain healthy self-care routines. Again, very important. Um, we attend to current crises and obstacles within teams and much, much more. So if you have any questions about that, again, you know, at the end, I'll, sh I'll share my contact information. You're welcome to reach out. So jumping right in, embracing conflict. We're going to talk about having a plan. We're going to address conflict head on. We're going to work to understand your co-founder's point of view. And finally, we'll come up with a solution. All right, so if you're new to the game or it's your first time experiencing conflict with your co-founder, it can be difficult to understand how to embrace conflict and fight fairly. When I get intake calls or emails requesting to work with Amity Chicago, um, 
typically one of the first things that founders or co-founders ask me to do is to help stop conflict. Um, how do we get rid of conflict? How do we avoid conflict? How do we prevent conflict moving forward? So actually the, here lies the problem, right? The answer I give, the treatment I offer has nothing to do with avoiding or stopping conflict. In fact, the solution is to embrace conflict. Conflict is a very healthy and normal part of any relationship. Um, I really like this uh, quote that I shared on the screen by Nate Reiger, who's the author of Conflict Without Casualties. Um, conflict is simply the energy created by the gap between what we want and what we are experiencing, right? So it's not necessarily or always a negative. Um, some of the benefits of embracing conflict. Now, I want to be very clear that this is if conflict is handled, you know, in a healthy manner, which we'll talk about moving forward. But, right, if done correctly, right, embracing conflict is a sign of trust and security, right? It allows for you and your co-founding team to trust one another and lean on one another and just kind of share your points of view. It encourages that. Um, it can bring up bottled up issues um, so that they can be resolved rather than, you know, just carrying them around. Um, it often leads to better decision in the sense that it allows for collaborative problem solving, um, again, if done correctly. And it usually binds people closer together. Now, this kind of sounds weird, I understand, but remember, right, the process of going through conflict, embracing conflict, working through someone, something, working through something with your team can ultimately make everyone feel a little bit closer. Um, it's, it's, you know, it can be a very valuable process. Okay. So first is having a plan. So we just established that conflicts are inevitable and oftentimes necessary for startups to evolve. So it's best to be prepared for those circumstances when conflict arise. Being prepared by having a written statement that outlines your individual roles, profits, um, liability, and workload distribution is quite helpful. Um, and it's a really, really great opportunity to also outline a conflict resolution game plan. Um, this way, when conflict inevitably will occur, um, you have a founder's agreement to refer to. Um, I have a lot of my founding teams do this work, whether they're in a state of crisis or even before, right, right when they get together, they're asking some of like, kind of like premarital therapy work. Um, they asked me to help kind of lay a healthy foundation. Um, this plan, this plan that's put in writing is quite, quite important. Um, it just really, again, right, lays structure. Um, it, it gives everyone a sense of what to expect. It's basically like the blueprint of your, your relationship agreement. Um, so when creating this plan, right, take time with your founding team um, and do this collaboratively, right? Share your thoughts, you know, take this as like a brainstorming session, identify the values, identify any constraints or any worries you might have, um, really talk this through. Um, it's important to remember that structure can help us feel grounded, especially when tensions arise, right? Um, you know, the, the position that you are all in or founders are in, entrepreneurs are in, is to, it can be high stress, it can be, um, you know, overwhelming at times. So, right, structure to lean back to can be very, very helpful. Um, now, really important, right, don't wait until a point of crisis. Conflict will happen. Prepare for it by getting everybody on the same page. Again, it's nice to have a blueprint. All right, so address conflict head on. It's a natural human tendency to avoid conflict. And by doing so, while you might feel like you're gonna help your business relationship, you won't, right? The harsh reality is that if you prolong addressing conflict, um, you're only likely to escalate the problem, uh, possibly repeat it to someone down the line or even worse, really damage your company. So, right, when you notice it, when you feel it, when you suspect it coming on, say something and then do something, turn to your co-founder, to your founding teams and mention it, right? Say that you're experiencing some sort of feeling or you're, something's coming up for you. Um, this really, you know, this level of self-awareness um, can be a very, very helpful tool. Um, pull out your conflict plan to, to lean on. This is what we just talked about in the previous slide. Um, again, it gives you, you know, an idea of what to do and how to move forward. Um, notice yourself and what you might feel you need as an individual in order to stay present and grounded. Now this again is, is taking accountability and, and noticing your part and, and how you respond to conflict um, and what you might need. Um, make time and space for conversation. This is really, really important. I work with a lot of founders who communicate solely on Slack at all hours of the day. Um, you, know, tr you know, really, like I said in the next point, right? Honor and respect this process, right? Make space for it, schedule it, make sure that everyone's able to show up presently. Um, now, I know that things are remote, um, you know, with the pandemic and a lot of companies, you know, work remotely. So, you know, if you can't do it in person, that's fine too, but try to schedule a face-to-face -face Zoom call, you know, as if we only more Zoom calls um, or, you know, a phone call um, in a quiet place where you can really, really focus. 
Um, take breaks if needed, um, but honor and respect the process. So I purposefully highlight, you know, bolded and underlined the word process because all of this, you know, this is a process. Addressing conflict is a process. It, it takes time. It takes practice. Um, there are going to be ups and downs, no doubt, but just, you know, respect and trust the process. Addressing and embracing conflict head on is not only positive for the founding partner relationships, but it can actually set a good example for your team. So win-win, right? That's good. Setting good uh, structure for, for the rest of the people that you might work with. Now, work to understand your co-founder's point of view. Um, as a founder, it can be easy to make the mistake of thinking that your point of view is the only correct one. And in turn, you might vocalize that to your co-founder or your co-founders. Um, which makes sense because after all, you're emotionally attached to this business and you've poured your blood, your sweat, your tears into it. But really, you know, after seeing your side, after only seeing your side, the damage can really, really be done to work in relationships, right? Make the effort to put yourself in your co-founder's shoes and truly listen to what they're saying during times of conflict, right? Truly try to understand what it is that they're trying to say, um, how they might feel, how they might be experiencing you. Do not get stuck due to stubbornness. Right. Do not get stuck due to ego and pride. Right. If you're going to get stuck, have it be over a business decision or something that you can collaborate with, you know, when it comes to working with your co-founder. But don't, you know, put pride aside. Try to understand what everyone on the team is saying. Um, your co-founder, your co-founder's point of view is just as valuable as yours. Um, remember, you're a team and you have to collaborate. That's why you all work together. That's why you all decided to found a team together. Um, take time to truly understand, like I said before, what it is your co-founders are trying to communicate learn from them, right? They, you all have various sets of skills. You all have various strengths and weaknesses, right? Really turn to each other and, and, and learn from one another. Um, remembering that you'll win some arguments, you'll lose some others, but at the end of the day, it's important to remember that your goal is to run a successful business and feel fulfilled doing so, right? All right, so coming up with a solution, this takes practice. Um, the same logic can be applied to co-founder conflicts as um, you know, driving in bad weather conditions. Steer into the skid is what I was told, which sounds terrifying, but lean into it, right? Um, if it's your first time in a co-founder dilemma, it's unlikely that you'll navigate, navigate the waters as a professional. Take the pressure off of yourself. It takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. It's essentially a muscle that you have to build. So you gotta keep flexing it. Um, each co-founding team has its unique process around problem solving, so it's important to take, the take time to get to know yours. Um, make time for this and be patient, like I said in previous slides, right? Try to schedule these conversations, try to schedule this process, um, make the time for it. Don't just kind of jump into it, you know, a few minutes before a meeting or a few minutes after a meeting, or especially right before bed. <laughs> um, that could lead to a few sleepless nights. Um, don't force a, loose, a solution, excuse me, don't force a solution be thoughtful and intentional. And of course, if it's more severe, if you're realizing that you're hitting a wall or tensions keep escalating or it's just feeling unsafe, emotionally unsafe or unproductive, um, it might be time to seek professional guidance. And I'll talk more about that um, towards the end. Okay, so now that we've laid down some of the groundwork around embracing conflict, preparing for conflict, um, I want us to talk about the concept of fighting fair, and I'm using air quotes around fighting fair. Um, I know you can't see me because I can't turn my camera off, but fighting fair in air quotes. Um, I'm using this term in active tense, meaning, you know, how can I engage in a fight, argument, disagreement in the moment in a productive manner, right? So really in vivo in the moment. Um, so a few notes why as to why it's important to fight fair. Um, one, it's important to remember that relationships are not static, right? You need to have these tools to fight fair because relationships ebb, ebb and flow. Um, they cycle through harmony, disharmony, and repair. You know, arguments, fights, conflict will happen. Um, there are always breaks and strains in the form of conflict, but there are also ways to mend those cracks. Um, as you seek improvements in your relationships, you'll see that how you treat each other's founders ripples out into the rest of the company and seeps into company culture. So another win-win-win, right? Um, you'll begin to give your team better cues on how to fight, how to respect each other, how to get along, and how to manage the inherent tensions that come with complementarity. Um, and that is where improving the co-founder relationship really starts to bolster the bottom line. So what I'm going to share with you in this next slide are just six practical, practical tips for conflict, navigating, navigating conflict in a healthier way and diffusing it if possible. Let's take a quick sip of water. Mm. A lot of talking, even for a therapist. Okay, so 
six tips to fighting fair. These are from Esther Perel. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with, with her work, but she's really fantastic. She is um, a therapist. Um, she does some work with founders now. Um, and she is, sorry, she is great. Sorry, Siri is speaking to me. So fighting fair, all right. So first point is pay attention to what's working, right? To break out of a negative mindset, you, have, you know, where you're constantly looking for faults and flaws, you should start keeping a daily list of all the positive things that your co-founder does. Now, maybe daily feels like a lot, um, but maybe just remember to keep those things top of mind when you're engaged in conflict or quote unquote a fight. Um, so remember, you know, get back in tune with what they do for the company that you appreciate. Um, what can you be thankful for? What might you be unable to accomplish without them? Tune into this if you start to notice yourself sliding into a negative mindset. Um, it will reconnect you to your co-founder and their strengths and possibly shift the tone of the conversation, right? So this is really great. Um, two, don't throw the kitchen sink at it, right? Piling on every complaint is a typical but not at all useful approach to dealing with conflict. Um, by the end, you'll have no idea what you're actually fighting about anymore. Instead, what you'll have, so instead what you should do is when you have a problem, deal with that problem only. Focus on fixing one issue at a time, right? One step at a time. Um, avoid character assassinations. This is huge. Here's an example, right? If I'm running late, it's because I get stuck in traffic. If my co-founder arrives late, it's because they're not invested enough in the company and she doesn't, or she or he doesn't prioritize my relationship and this feels horrible, right? Do not go there, right? Skip these types of fights by thinking about temporary and circumstantial explanations for your co-founder's behavior as you do for your own, as often as you can, right? So have empathy for them. Um, Four, figure out if you're fight, flight, or freeze. Um, so we all handle conflict differently. Um, some of us might be more explosive and lash out while others retreat inward and withdraw, right? So fight, flight, or freeze. Some people fight, some people withdraw and flight or flight, and some people just freeze, right? So they're literally no words. They feel emotionally flooded, hard to, to access some thoughts. Um, there's often a contrast between the pursuer and the distancer. And what makes it more difficult is that the one who is attacking intensifies the withdrawal of the person and vice versa, right? So these fighting styles, um, these conflict styles tend to feed off of each other in, in a really negative way and, and it's very unhelpful. So um, it's really, really helpful to notice, you know, how what your conflict style looks like and, and what your co-founder or co-founder's conflict styles looks like. Because if you have awareness over how it's gonna go, um, you can, you know, prepare for it and, and you know, point it out when it's happening, ask for, for some space if you feel yourself in this flight mode or ask to cool off if you're fighting through it, right? It, it's quite helpful to just notice what's going on. Um, stop talking in categoricals. Um, statements such as you always or you never or you just never or you just don't um, should be stripped out of your vocabulary. Um, we have a tendency to confuse our experiences and feelings with facts. You present the accusation as a fact, but really it's just an expression of your experience. Um, the other person typically will always be ready to refute with one contrary example. So you'll just be missing the mark um, if you're constantly just putting these really, really tough statements out like that. Um, and so lastly, start the 10 second shot clock. So the um, uh, pro uh, Relationship Enhancement Program, um, which is Howard Markman's, um, their research highlights that when people are in conflict, they don't listen to more than 10 seconds of someone's argument before they start building their rebuttal. Um, so you essentially could rattle off an entire list of issues of which there are a dozen complaints that are totally acceptable, but your co-founder will push back on the one thing that they hear that they disagree with and validating everything else that you said. So try to keep it short, pause, and ask them to reflect back, reflect back to you what it is that you just said. So if anyone um, out there who's watching, who will watch this later has, if anyone's been in couples therapy, this is also, um, called the speaker listener exercise. It's, it's quite helpful. It slows conversations down into bite-sized digestible pieces and um, people are able to kind of reflect back what it is they're hearing and, and make sure that we're, you know, they're hearing the right thing before moving on. Um, helpful tool. Okay, so what happens if there's too much conflict? We're gonna talk about setting boundaries. We're gonna just go through the sense of evaluating what's going on and then we'll discuss, you know, briefly how to get some help. So, while conflict is a natural part of a co-founder relationship or even becoming an entrepreneur, um, fighting all the time is, is pretty much a recipe for a strained relationship, right? How could it not be? It's important to identify boundaries to notice all components of the relationship, including yourself, right? You were a big part of the relationship, obviously. 
All right, so one, it's important that you take some time and re-examine your roles, your responsibilities, your workload, um, define it, re-examine it, make sure it works for you, set boundaries around it. Sometimes we need to reset in order to better align ourselves with the vision. Um, yeah, see if it still makes sense. You know, things change as companies grow, responsibilities change, or sometimes they don't feel good anymore, right? Set boundaries over what it is that you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. Talk about this with your co-founder or your co-founders. Um, assess for burnout, right? It's important that you advocate for yourself. Um, how might you be contributing to the dynamic? Are you doing okay? Are you taking care of yourself? Do you need something? If so, right, make sure you, you get appropriate help. Um, also then structured communication. Um, structured and boundaried communication really helps with productive communication. Um, so essentially what this means, kind of what I was speaking to before, right? So no texting or slacking here and there randomly if it's something important. Um, you know, try to really, really set structure around when, when you're all speaking just to make sure it's intentional and respectful and, and everyone can just, you know, be thoughtful when they're in that space. Um, now, I also just want to say, I understand that that might feel like a luxury when you're running a company. I get that. Sometimes we're up at all hours. We need to reach, you know, our co-founder at 4 a.m. I have done this myself. Um, sometimes it makes sense, you know, sometimes we can understand, but right, try not to make a practice out of it because um, it, it's an important boundary, right, um, to be able to get good sleep or to be able to turn work off every now and then. Um, it's important. Um, like I said before, don't let disagreements fester. Nip it in the bud. If you feel something happening, if you're feeling something, say something. This is really, really important. Um, and then lastly, identify and practice your own healthy coping mechanisms. It's really important that you take care of yourself. Like I said, you are an equally important part of the dynamic. So you have to make sure that you're able to, you know, to be there and, and to tend to your work and to your co-founding relationship in a healthy way. All right, now we're gonna talk about taking a minute to evaluate, you know, sometimes in these really high stress situations, we, became, we become so hyper-focused and so zoomed in. Um, and almost kind of like this like survival mode state of being while, you know, I totally understand that and respect that. It's really, really important to take a step back, to take a breath and to understand what's going on, to reevaluate the situation. I do a lot of this work with my founders. Um, they get hyper-focused on one issue or another issue or one crisis or something else. And by having them step back, it really is kind of like a breath of, you know, of oxygen, right, of fresh air, and, and you're able to kind of see the situation with clear eyes. Um, and, and that, you know, that, that can be the, the co-founding relationship. Sometimes you take a step back and you notice what feels okay, you notice what's not working, you notice, you know, where the two or three or how many, how many ever you have, uh, how many of you have, whoever there, um, how it's going for everybody. Um, so this is a really, really important part of the process. Um, something I also do with the work, and, and this is definitely difficult, is taking a step back and, and evaluating the relationship as a whole. Is it still a good fit? I have founders who decide to, you know, go in different ways and, and that's okay. Um, sometimes it's not a good fit and, and it's okay to acknowledge that. And sometimes that's the best, best thing for the company. And, and I get that that's controversial and, and perhaps hard to hear, but it happens and, you know, if so, you know, we deal with it. Um, all righty. So a little heads up if you're experiencing these things, right? If, if you're noticing yourself feeling some of this, um, it might be time to have a conversation with your co-founder, your co-founders and, and yourself, right? If you were noticing that you're avoiding your co-founder, right? That means that you're, you're feeling something, you don't feel safe, you don't feel trusting of being able, or you're, right? You're experiencing, you know, a hard time communicating, conflict with your co-founder, you're avoiding them, right? And like I say, you know, the more you avoid, the more energy something gains. So not a good thing. Um, if you're noticing that you're keeping your interactions to a minimum, again, that's a sign that you're avoiding them, that, that you're removing yourself, that you're withdrawing, um, that you're not trusting of your ability to, you know, communicate or move forward. Um, if you're feeling as if your co-founder does not appreciate or acknowledge your efforts, um, you know, this can be a sign of burnout and possible resentment. Um, it can leave, you know, room for resentment to grow. Um, questioning your co-founder's motivations and or business intentions is a sign of distrust, right? So pay attention to that. You need trust in a healthy working relationship. Um, poor workload balance where one founder is doing more work than the other. Again, that's an opportunity for burnout and resentment. 
Um, you or your co-founder become defensive when making critical business decisions. Um, that would tell us that you're, you're having trouble with conflict, um, that, you know, that you're having some trouble with escalation and, and just, you know, having tough, tough conversations. Um, finally, harboring resentments. Um, you know, resentments, we like to call resentments, frustrations, ugly cousin. Um, it, it's, it, they're difficult to work through. Um, they run deep, they're, they're deep rooted. And, and um, that's typically, you know, a, a significant yellow flag. Um, so notice that. All right. And now time for some additional help, right? So one of the biggest takeaways here is always keep an open mind to additional help. And I am not just plugging Amity or the type of work I do, just in general, it's so important to have support. Um, and the work you do, it, it, it can be high stress. It, it takes a lot, right? Find support through coach, investors, Amity, now slight plug, Amity, <laughs> mentors, friends, therapists, right? This is quite important. Um, don't be afraid to bring in the pros. Be open to getting professional help, either individually to help you respond to ongoing conflict or as a group, right? It's quite important. And uh, yeah, that concludes my presentation. Um, we'll just take a few minutes to go through any questions you might have. Um, I'm gonna turn on my video. So I am back and I will get out of this. Thank you so much, Myra. You really give of course. Us some great food for thought here. Um, we do have a couple minutes for questions. So feel free to um, keep putting those in the chat. Um, okay. Did want to start out with one. Are there any um, common disagreements or common topics you see in terms of co-founding teams and issues that, you know, kind of seem to happen over and over again? Does that ever happen? Yeah. So common, common issues, essentially. Yeah. Like maybe like what are like the common topics that seem to come up in, you know, a variety of teams and clients? Certainly, yeah. I mean, one very common one is, you know, the, the issue around hiring, right? Who to hire, why you're hiring, what, you know, how to go through the interview process. Um, typically, people, founders have different um, priorities or just values around how they're adding individuals onto their team. So that's typically, you know, usually with growth in general, there's some growing pains. So I think that's why hiring can feel a little tense at times because you're experiencing those growing pains. It's all positive, but, you know, it can be painful. Um, and then, you know, a common issue is, again, just like communication styles, like I mentioned in the presentation, right, people have very, very different communication styles, and whatever topic it is, the way they approach it really, really impacts outcome. Um, and, you know, unless you've been to therapy, which, you know, which is great, and, but unless you've been to therapy, and, and you've been taught to re therapy or coaching or anything, right, and you've been taught to really, really learn how to communicate effectively and receive information effectively and learn about who you're communicating to, um, it, it's a hard skill. Um, so, you know, self-awareness around all of this is huge. And, um, you know, I do a lot of that work with, with my founders and my co-founders. So there's just a few examples. Eight. Um, question in the chat. Um, do you have lists or examples of the founders agreement? And I believe that's referring to the conflict resolution plan. So could you maybe go over what components might go into a type of plan like that? Yeah, so, you know, conflict. So this is actually something that um, I can, you know, send your way so that you can share it to the participants or anyone who's um, interested. It's just kind of a template of what I've created in the past with different founders. Um, so essentially, you know, the work around that is I'll take time with these founders to get to know them and again, understand their communication styles and conflict styles. And then we'll just basically write out what it is that they need individually or, you know, in the relationship to get through conflict. Um, and then it's always kind of identifying what the goal of these conversations are too. So it's setting the expectation um, and it'll change, right? Depending on the conflict or, you know, whatever com communication they need to have. Um, but it's just really highlighting and addressing like how you go about it. And the reason why I can't just kind of spot it off right now is because again, it's, it's very um, dependent on who we're working with. Um, it's not one size fits all, we tailor a treatment, but I do have, you know, kind of like a rough general template I can share. And then, you know, whoever's receiving it, if they're interested, we'll, they'll fill it out with their founder and then we'll, they'll have their own, <laughs> their own example. Great. Um, another question in the chat, how do you handle a narcissist? And, um, maybe to add to that, maybe how would you handle um, a disagreement between two co-founders where maybe one isn't even acknowledging that there's an issue or a problem. 
Ooh, so heavy worry, right? Narcissist, right? I, you know, if that's the level and, and that's perhaps what this particular founder, you know, is experiencing, you know, it might be time to get help, right? Yeah not diagnosing so I don't know the situation but if they're feeling like it's just completely impossible um, that means it's time for you know a third party um, and if they were to work with me or anybody else right it would be a lot of one-on-one -on -one with each founder to really get them to a place where they could hear one another um, and understand the importance of doing so um, but but that's tough work um, and so you know again advice to the individual that's and this is very common again, right? It's super common, but any advice I might have is ask for help, get support on your own. Um, it's a very, very tough and frustrating situation. Advocate for yourself, stand up for yourself, right? Don't just withdraw because it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, I really truly think that with outside help, um, you can kind of structure the conversations in a safe way so that you can be productive. Um, it's really important that you don't, you know, allow yourself to be in a situation where you just feel like you're constantly being bulldozed over <laughs> um, because of perhaps some narcissistic qualities. Um, so. Yeah, definitely time to bring in the professionals in that scenario. Yes. Yeah. Um, tough. Yeah. Uh, another question, any recommendations for the reading? Um, and do you know of any, um, maybe online games or resources that someone could use to practice some of these skills? Ooh, I don't know about online games, um, but I think that in terms of just like practicing communication skills, so this is interesting. Um, and again, this is, I can share more resources if anybody would like to follow up with me. Um, but a lot of this, the work that comes around communication comes from um, couples work <laughs> um, because there's just so much research out there about how to communicate in a, rela a romantic relationship and not enough. There's some work now moving, moving forward around how to communicate in, in a co-founder co relationship, which is great. But um, if, if anyone's ever curious, I definitely recommend, you know, looking up Esther Perel is really great. Um, she has a lot of work around this. Um, uh, what else? Um, looking through, you know, Johnson and Johnson, um, that they do something around, uh, not Johnson Johnson, sorry, <laughs> Dr. John Gottman. Um, he does a lot of work around just identifying conflict styles, communication styles, and, and how that plays out. Obviously, I'm thinking about the vaccine, Johnson and Johnson. But yeah, Dr. Gottman um, does a lot of work around, um, right, like how disruptive and, and just unique communication styles play out in a dynamic. Um, so Dr. John Gottman. Um, has a lot of work around this. And again, if anyone's curious, I have so many lists of just books and, and resources. I'm not sure if there are any games that I'm familiar with, but um, a lot of helpful things. So, you know, feel free to email me um, or um, I can follow up uh, and just kind of shoot this over. So then uh, Katie, you can send it out to any participants. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, do you have any recommendations um, you know, in the really early formations of the team, how people can implement this right away, as opposed to maybe like six, eight months down the line, and then something happens and they don't know what to do. Yeah, so, you know, I, that I love kind of where that, that question comes from. I think it's like, I think I mentioned before in, in the presentation, you know, it's really, you don't have to work for a crisis to happen to start going through some of these motions, right? Um, when I work with early stage companies, new partnerships, we lay those foundations. We talk about expectations, communication styles. We do something called radical self-inquiry. Now this is, you know, some radical self-inquiry is a little bit more complicated. Um, and so I'd recommend doing that with a professional um, just to kind of help facilitate those conversations. But essentially it's learning about yourself and how you, will, you know, how you show up as a leader and, and how you relate to others um, in a le leadership team. Um, it's, so again, it's, it's really getting to know yourself, getting to know your partner, setting expectations, talking about just what's important values, almost kind of like, you know, not necessarily a mantra, but like, you know, just like, um, like a mission statement, right? Um, uh, this is important because it's like sometimes when we feel overwhelmed or, you know, relationships get complicated and, and they do, um, you have something to fall back on. You have something that can be re-motivating, re-energizing, inspiring, and essentially because you wrote it early on, um, you know, when we're all still very, very, not that you lose motivation, but as things get hard, sometimes we kind of lose sight of all the exciting bits. Um, so it, it's great to be doing that work early on. 
Great. Um, the next couple questions have to do with maybe specific, more specific scenarios. So might be able to answer, might not. Um, mm -hmm. The question of, could you give an example of how a conflict plan might be utilized in a hypothetical situation? Yeah, so let's see. Um, hypothetical situation. So let's just say that, you know, you are fundraising and you're noticing that one of the co-founders is doing a lot of like, just like taking a lot of initiative around reaching out. You know, I, I don't know how many people out there have fundraised, but it is a very, very stressful process. And typically, you know, it, it, for some reason, um, there's tends to be like a little bit of imbalance and, and workload and responsibilities. Um, and that might be because one founder or two founders just naturally navigate to just more outreach work. Um, you know, being the quote unquote face of the company, who knows, right? It's just, it's, it's an easier space for them to be in, but they end up taking on a lot. And so they start to feel burnt out, um, whereas the other founder might just feel like they're just waiting around for something to happen. Um, that can be a really, really, um, you know, tense situation because again, there's imbalance. Um, so if you refer back to this agreement where you talk about just expectations and, and roles and responsibilities and if there is conflict, right, like I'm starting to feel escalated and um, I need you to understand why um, I need to learn how to express myself or better express myself with you in the room right now. Like, look what we agreed on, right? We said we would make time to have these conversations. Can we sit down and talk through it? Um, it that's actually something that, that happens quite often. <laughs> Um, that hypothetical situation. I hope that answered the question, but that could be an example. Yeah, I think that was a, a great example. Um, another question in the chat, how do you handle founders who have to touch or review every email, every document, et cetera, before it's sent, yet they um, are never around when you know that approval process needs to actually happen, therefore causing delays? How am I mm. in that situation? Wow, that's very specific uh, <laughs> in a stressful situation. So forever sent it, I, I feel you, that must be really frustrating. I mean, again, like that, that's a great example of like, you're noticing a dynamic that's not working. You're noticing that there is a constraint in productivity because of responsibility, a responsibility that falls on someone that, um, that you trust on, on a co-founder. Um, so that is a great opportunity to say, listen, like I need to, you know, can we schedule a call? Can we go on a coffee walk? Can we do, you know, whatever we can do to have, you know, an intentional and thoughtful conversation and talk about what it is that's happening, right? You are in charge of all of these emails, it's really, you know, I, I depend on you to do so. And yet for whatever reason, it's not happening. There's a delay. And if there's a delay that affects me, can we talk through that process for you and perhaps, you know, you know how that process looks so I can better understand it and how I can work with it. Um, essentially, right, lack of communication around this gives this other founder that's just, you know, probably frustrated and, and, and you know, constrained. It doesn't give them anything to work with. They're just in a position where they just have to wait. Um, that's, that's frustrating. Um, so naming that, right? Naming how you're feeling, naming the constraints, naming how you were, you're looking for change, but also willing to collaborate, right? So hearing how your co-founder is handling the situation, understanding why they work the way that they do and, and you know, collaborating towards make, finding a solution. Thanks, Myra, that's a great answer. Um, another question, when you can recognize that um, most minor conflicts might be triggering a flight or fight reaction from the other person that you know is deep seated into something traumatizing that happened in their past and that other person isn't ready to acknowledge that emotion and not ready to mm -hmm. anyone else. So I, I think the question is asking um, if you are recognizing that seated issue, but maybe the other person doesn't necessarily. Yeah, that might be a, an opportunity to seek some outside help, right? Um, you know, working with a professional so that this other founder can maybe feel like they have a safe place to process perhaps their experience of it. Um, you know, any professional, um, I'm not going to say any, but a lot of professionals in the space that I work in and, and myself, think, right, if it were me, I, I would be curious about this, this perhaps response and I would take them for a one-on-one -on -one session and, and, and kind of see how they experience it. Um, but, you know, the, a founder or co-founder should not be in a position of having to point something out that that is, that, that's that intimate and personal. 
um, because that, um, you know, that's just, that can be a boundary crossing. Um, I'm not sure what the dynamics like, like, again, like, you know, the, the answers to these questions, it's not one size fits all. It's so dependent on who, who I would be working with, but um, that's a good opportunity for some outside help. Um, and, you know, for the, the other founder who's having to navigate um, you know, you know, this awareness that they have, it, it's important that they get support too, and they get coached on how to manage those situations themselves. Um. Yeah, definitely. That, that makes sense. Um, one other question in the chat for pre-investment startups, how would you recommend getting, uh, help from professionals when you have a limited or virtually no budget? I hear you. <laughs> Right, so uh, when we started, when my co-founder and I started this work, we, we did a lot of work with, with individuals in that situation, right? You know, the work we, I do, unfortunately, is not cheap. It's, it's quite expensive. That being said, we have, and I'm, this is, I'm not, I don't want this to sound like too much of a plug, but it, it's true. We have a very soft spot for early stage companies. That, that's really where we started. Um, and so we do offer sliding fee and, 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 such, and you know, financial agreements that are more suiting. Um, to, you know, teams in that position. And I know of others that do the same. Um, so, you know, maybe to answer your question is, right, find, find some people who are willing to take you on at a lower, at a lower rate. Um, they're out there. Um, and if not, right, there are a lot of books and resources. And again, like I can follow up and, and share these resources. Um, there are a lot of books and resources that you can turn to um, and, and just try to educate yourself through that. Great. Um, we are approaching um, close to the end. So if there are any final questions, feel free to put those in the chat. But I do just have a couple um, before we end here. Um, Myra, I'm curious what your recommendation is for setting boundaries when we're working in a digital environment. And for many people right now, their home environment and their work environment are the same place. So what would be your recommendation? Mm -hmm setting those types of boundaries, um, given those current <clears throat> circumstances. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, I get it too, right? We're all working. I mean, yeah, I, I have, uh, you know, and I used to work in my bedroom, so I understand <laughs> that, right, those boundaries get crossed and it's weird. Um, but, you know, more than anything, it, it's really structure your time, right? So I find that that helps a ton if you're saying like, I'm only checking email from, you know, what 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. or whatever time that works for you and really hold yourself to that because that is some control that you do have right now due to the pandemic. We can't control that we're all working from home. Um, hopefully that'll end soon. Um, but there are things that we can control within the home, right? So setting limits to just activity around work, um, you know, silencing your phone when you are at the dinner table or when you're taking a break or you're, when you're going on a walk, um, that's huge too. And, and I would actually invite you all to have these conversations with your teams to see how you can support each other through that and, and, and perhaps to come up again, I'm using this word a lot, but with a collaborative plan, right, to set really, really healthy values within your company and say, listen, like, I want to respect boundaries you have at home now that we're all working from home and that's a weird situation to be in. A lot of pros who don't have to commute, but overall kind of weird. Um, right. So talk through it. And, and I think on an individual level, notice what it is that you need and communicate that with your team so that they can respect it. Um, so, yeah, small things such as scheduling times to talk, you know, making sure you're not working straight into the night. Do not work from your bed if possible. <laughs> um, a lot of sleep experts would say that that will take a toll on your quality of sleep, um, you know, and make sure you get comfortable. Um, I don't know how much longer, you know, we'll all be working from home or maybe some of these teams here are just remote moving forward, um, but invest in, in, a, in a nice setup too, right? Get a, get a comfortable chair, um, get like, you know, a, a, a nice table, good lighting so that you feel like when you sit down for work and you turn your light on that you're as much as you can in, in a workspace. Great suggestions, um, not only for startup founders, but um, anyone um, working in this. Yeah. Zoom world. Um, yeah. Question in the chat, how do you manage a partner that joins an ongoing project but doesn't really understand the plan, but um, is appearing they're contributing a lot but not really, not really being helpful? Hmm. Well, I mean, I find it problematic to hear that they don't really understand the plan. <laughs> 
Um, and that would probably be like, the, that's my first point of focus would we'll go straight to there. It's like, you know, how, how can they properly contribute if they don't fully understand the plan? Um, there needs to be, you know, we all, I mean, right, whether they, if you can, information needs to be shared with them or they need to get on board with that. Um, and the plan will also hopefully include values and in how you expect to contribute, right? The expectations there, um, people in their roles. Um, so I just went straight there, right? Fill them in on the plan if possible and, and get them to sign into that, right? To consent that these are the values in the company, like you have to show up a certain way. This is why we're doing what we're doing. This is how we're doing, you know, the work. So if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um... I guess this will be our final question. Um, do you have recommendations for founding teams where the team has a relationship outside of work? So maybe it's a spousal relationship or family members. And I'm wondering how this dynamic plays out when there's other relationships involved um, in the founding team. So this is tricky. Um, so I work with a lot of founding teams where, you know, the founders started off as best friends, you know, college roommates, great friends, siblings, um, and even, you know, partners, like romantic partners. Um, I think that, you know, it's totally doable. I'm going to speak to the romantic partners first, because that one's a very complex relationship. Um, essentially, you're wearing two, two hats. Um, they're dual relationships. And so while it's doable, you have to recognize the, the sense of dual relationships here. You have to really, again, back to this work, this word boundary, like you really have to boundary the work and your relationship. Otherwise it overflows and things get mixed up. And, um, you know, it's just, it, it can be a huge recipe for disaster. I've worked with a lot of founders, more than surprisingly more than I thought, a lot of founders who have romantic ties. And again, I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying if you're doing it, um, please, please, please put in the work to make sure that it's, it's boundaried, it's safe, that, you know, perhaps even work with a professional um, or a couples therapist, right? Like work with somebody to help you kind of identify the complexities of that relationship. Um, and the same goes, you know, for friends um, to a lesser extent, right? Because, uh, you know, you don't go home, well, maybe, maybe roommates, right? Um, but you, you don't have that intimacy piece there. Um, you know, if it's friends, right, you have to notice, I don't know why my Siri keeps popping up. Um, you have to notice the ways in which um, the relationship is going to change. I work with a lot of companies, a lot of founders, like I said, who, who start off as friends and it's really, really great, but eventually the relationship evolves and it becomes more of like a co-founding relationship and a little bit less of a friendship. Um, and there's a lot of grief around that and it doesn't have to be that way. For some reason, it tends to go in that direction and there's a little bit of grief around that. So um, you know, if you don't want it to kind of slide to just into the co-founding relationship, right, put some work into it, notice it, perhaps similarly to, you know, the more romantic relationships, right, talk about, you know, the, the duality of, of your positions and, and how things are going to feel moving forward, you know, create really, really strong and healthy boundaries, um, you know, spend time as co-founders, but make sure you also spend time as friends, but also give yourself space from one another, um, because sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're working together and you're also friends, it is really hard to uh, not just talk about work, right? How could you not? It's kind of like all this stuff happened today. Now we're going to go grab a beer and all we can talk about is all this stuff, right? Make sure that when you're hanging out as friends, be friends. Don't only talk about work, right? Talk about the stuff that used to interest you before work. Um, that will help you maintain the relationship as a friend, you know, so... Great. Well, thank you so much, Myra, for sharing your expertise and your thoughts and your suggestions with all of us. Um, definitely a lot to learn um, just from this session. So I hope you all enjoyed it and are able to take away something from it um, with relationships with your co-founding team or, um, you know, co colleagues or whoever that might be. Um, I will send out those resources that Myra mentioned. And I will also send out a link as well for you to sign up for future Polsky workshops. But Myra, is there anything you'd like to leave the people with before we sign off for today? 
No, I mean, really, it was a pleasure, you know, to, to have this opportunity and to answer your questions. And, you know, if you have any other thoughts or any other, you know, questions, like, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to connect with people. So you know, being a therapist, I, talk, you know, I could talk a lot and I'm curious and, you know, I love collaborating. So, you know, reach out if you need anything, but good luck with what it is that you're doing and, you know, stay safe with the pandemic. And I'm hearing that the weather in Chicago is getting better. So I hope you all have an opportunity to enjoy some sunshine. Yes, please do take that opportunity. Um, thank you again, Myra. And thanks to you of course. for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Be well. Bye. Bye.